Gott ist so nett, gell? Oh, ist das gut? Okay, thank you very much. I think at the same time when Bill Gates watched your videos, Tom did it also, it was in 2009. And this was a time when everything started for us because Tom gave a talk in our institute seminar in 2010. Uh, electrochemical energy storage is what could magnetohydrodynamic contribute to that. And then I was also watching your videos this one in 2010, I guess, at MIT. And I remember that you said scalable at low cost. This brings me back to exactly your point now, how large can they be built? And I remember that you said, okay, they can be built quite, quite large. And this brought us into, into the business. Uh, and so at the same time, by accident, we were dealing with an experiment on the Taylor instability. And because always when you have a hammer, all the world looks like a nail. And so we were looking, uh, can we apply what we have learned for the Taylor instability for liquid metal batteries? And this will be the first talk to, uh, part of my talk on Taylor instability. And when preparing my slides, I noticed, oh, so we did a lot in Rossendorf, but a lot has been done here in Cambridge. So it's a perfect place to give this talk because many, many of the work and inspirations come from Cambridge. Of course, the first one is Roger John Taylor, who was at the beginning, Keith, I think you, you will know, he was at the beginning of the 60s here in, in Cambridge, a great astrophysicist who de developed the concept of Taylor instability. Lord Rayleigh was here. We are doing experiments on Rayleigh convection, rayleigh banner convection. Peter Davidson is here, who did fundamental work on electrovortex flow, and K. Leo did uh, some work here. And I saw Gordon O'Gilvy. Uh, Gordon, is he here? Um, yeah, Gordon is here working a lot on tidally uh, influenced cosmic bodies, and we do also some work, Gerrit Hoffmann, on tidally influenced uh, flows. So this will be approximately the schedule of my talk, most part here in the Taylor on the Taylor instability. So Taylor instability is coming from plasma physics. It, uh, there are thousands of papers dealing with different instabilities in so-called set pinches, so we have first the axisymmetric instability, m equals zero, m is the azimuthal uh, symmetry, and this is called the sausage instability. So you make like this, and this, and this, and this, and this is a sausage instability. And then we have the non axisymmetric king type instability, which is here, uh, and the ideal stability criteria are like this for the m equals zero, and then this criterion from coming from Taylor, maybe a little bit earlier, but Taylor in 1973. So it means the Taylor instability is, does not appear when the product of R times B phi, this is this magnetic field squared, is smaller than one. I said that at the same time when we watched your videos, uh, we did an experiment because there were plenty of experiments in plasma physics dealing with M0, M1 instabilities, but there had never been one in liquid metals. And we thought, why? Why is it so complicated to do a pinch, uh, sorry, a king type instability in a liquid metal experiment? And in the course of time, we learned that it's really not, not that easy. So we did an extremely elementary experiment. We took a column, 75 centimeters of gallium and 10 centimeters di uh, uh, diameter, and then we run a current until 8,000 amps through it, and we are looking what, what's going on. Deliberately, we didn't use any sensors, any holes. We wanted to have an extremely homogeneous current, not to be uh, uh, not to be spoiled, not to spoiling the experiment by any electrovortex flows, which will later appear here. So we made a very, very homogeneous current here. And so we measured the flow induced velo velocity perturbations by a couple of flux gate sensors here at this point. Here is a, a picture of the uh, experiment, and here's a power supply giving us 8,000 amps. This was a PRL paper by Martin Seilmeier et al. 
And what we noticed, it was quite hard to get some good result here. Uh, at the end of the day, we found some reasonable agreement of the growth rate of this king type Taylor instability on the current and independence on the radius of an immersed inner non-conducting rod. So if we have a non-conducting rod here in the center, then the critical current, which is approximately 3,000 amps, uh, grows to 4,000, 5,000 amps. So we have seen this, and it was quite a reasonable agreement with the, with the numerics, not perfect, but, but quite reasonable. As I said, it was uh, exactly this time when we were looking for what could be contribute to uh, LMBs. And of course, we were thinking, okay, there is a natural limitation. Even if you manage to make your LEDs and your electrodes extremely homogeneous, if you make the batteries quite large, there comes a moment when the uh, current becomes so large in the order of a few thousand amps that you get a vigorous motion. And at some time, depending of course on the thickness of the electrolyte layer, it will be washed away and you will get a short circuit. This was the main idea here. And so with Tom, we wrote quite quickly uh, a paper in a, in a funny journal, Energy Conversion of Management. And management. I, I never published again in this one, but anyway. So, <laughs> we, uh, so we did here how to circumvent the size limitation of liquid metal batteries uh, due to the Taylor instability. And the main idea was the following. We went back to Taylor's stability criteria. Radial derivative of R times B phi squared should be zero. Now imagine that we have a liquid metal battery and we have drilled a hole here and we have a current going in, the, in whatever direction in the middle he here. And then we can take the B phi of R in this expression alpha R plus beta over R. And then we find that we have the alpha and beta like this and our uh, uh, condition here transfers into this condition here, and this has two solutions. So either your current in the middle must be a counter current, it must be minimum the same current as through the fluid, or it must be a current in the same direction, but much stronger and depending on the ratio of the radii, which is here eta. And you see that in between, we have always some part of our R times B phi squared where it is, uh, where it is increasing. Here is minus, it's not, not very important. Uh, but here are the limits. And this was the first idea, okay, here is a chance, even if you build it very, very large, if you drill a hole and you take a current and dry, go, uh, you have a counter current in the middle, it will be completely stable against the Taylor instability. This was the main idea of this paper. And then we said, OK, if we don't have this current in the middle, uh, could we still gain something by simply using uh, this, uh, this bore here? So we had to go to non-ideal MHD. So we solved this with a shooting method, this system of 10 first order uh, equations, it's the eigenvalue system, and we found that indeed, depending on the ratio of the inner to the outer radius, we can indeed increase the critical current. Here is the example for gallium indium tin, not very important for the battery, but we, we used it always. And you can, with a certain radius ratio, increase it by a factor three or four. And uh, so we, uh, solved for a couple of cases. So we were also looking for the M0, uh, for the M0 mode, which is always above. We were looking for different boundary conditions. And then we found here a critical Hartmann number, 21.09. And we were quite happy when Wietze came up a couple of years later and with the an analytical solution, and he found the same 21.09 for the instability here. Uh, okay, this would have given a certain chance to even if you, if you lose some, some area by drilling the hole, so the increase of the critical current could have helped in increasing the storage capacity of the uh, battery before any uh, destabilization of the electrolyte would have happened here. 
Okay, so this was all 1D linear stability analysis, what uh, theoreticians like, uh, usually do. And then we were quite happy uh, to get Norbert Weber on board. I think for us it was quite, quite, we were really happy. Uh, Norbert, for us it was good. I do not know was it good for you to come to us. I, I'm, I'm not sure. And Norbert developed a very, very nice code based on open foam. Uh, he implemented Poisson equation in open foam, and then we needed also Biot-Savart's law to get the uh, induced magnetic field here. This is a little bit strange, and we did not understand this point at the very beginning. So we are liquid metal people, and usually we are thinking in terms of uh, inductionless approximation, which is always nice. So forget about B, but take G. But this is not valid here because we have already a current in the system. So that's the product of G zero times B, little b, is the same or is the same order as the product of little g times B zero. So we must take, in order to describe the Taylor instability, so we must take the little b in our code. We cannot forget it. And so we did, and Norbert made a very nice code. Uh, so we made a lot of mistakes. Norbert, you remember that, uh, so we, we took the CFL criterion wrong. We took it with the, with the velocity. We had to take the Alfein velocity for the CFL criterion, stuff like this. But finally, the, uh, the code started to work, and the first job Norbert had was to simulate our experiment here. So he did. Here was a really realistic simulation uh, run, uh, coming to quite small velocities, some millimeters per second, and we saw that our growth rate independence on the, uh, on the current through the liquid was in quite good agreement. It is, it's a little bit lower than the infinitely long system, but it was quite in good agreement with what we had measured in the experiment. Then Norbert started to, to play more. Of course, the battery is not infinitely long. It's even not, not, not uh, that tall. It's more like this. And he was looking, what is the dependence of the critical current on the ratio of the height over the width? So here, in this case, we took a rectangular uh, battery or, or whatever. And you see here, this is the asymptotic regime we are going to. This is the number for gallium medium tin again, some three, three kiloamps. And then if you make the height smaller and smaller, your critical current, not surprisingly, is increasing dramatically. So this means if you make the battery flatter, it becomes less prone to the Taylor instability, as it should be. It's quite, quite clear. OK, now the question comes, Taylor instability, OK, nice thing theoret uh, for theoreticians and maybe dynamo people. But when does a battery really fail? That's still another topic. And we need, some, we need some speed, we need some music in the, in the system in order to wash away the electrolyte. And a good idea, a good criterion is to say, OK, when I wash away my electrolyte, I gain some uh, potential energy by, by lifting it up. And this potential energy should be in the same range as the uh, kinetic energy of the flow here. This gives us a so-called Richardson number, and this should be in the order of one, approximately. It might be 0 0.5 or 2, but in the order of one, this is a good, a good idea. So we made some very funny uh, experiments, numerical experiments with Norbert's uh, um, code. It was done by Leopold Barry in a master thesis. A completely unrealistic model, so we took uh, we took five millimeters electrolyte thickness, which is okay. We took magnesium salt uh, antimon battery, <laughs> and then we took uh, 50 millimeters diameter and 30 kiloamps, which is ridiculous, of course. But we wanted to see what happened, and we we got the battery to fail uh, as it as it should be. All this was done much more better by Vice Hermann and Caroline Nor in this great paper, JFM 2015. They, they took all this Richardson criterion much more seriously. And what they came up is this fantastic plot here. So you see here the radius of the battery. And here the height of the 
electrolyte. So let it, let it be between one millimeter and five millimeters. So this is the realistic regime here. And then let's take a magnesium-based battery and here is an extremely high current density, 100 kilohams per square meter, which is uh, more than realistic, I, I would say. And in this case, you would get a critical radius because this height scales with the radius to the sixth, a critical, uh, a critical radius of, uh, what is it, some 20 or 30 centimeters, right? For the more realistic case, 10 kilo ampere square meter, we would come into the dangerous regime here at approximately 1.5 meter. This means so below 1.5 meter, everything, you, you can forget everything. There is no danger from the Taylor instability to destroy the battery. This is good news for you, bad news for us because we were a little bit on the wrong track. We wanted to study Taylor instability. At the end of the day, it turned out to be not very important. Uh, still, we learned something here. And because we are Dynamo people, we were looking for some mean field coefficients connected with the Taylor instability. Axel Brandenburg is here. He has worked a lot on alpha effect for Taylor instability. And we wanted to see what is going on here in a, in a real liquid metal at low magnetic bundle numbers. And before I show this, let me remind you of the two possibilities how one could, in principle, stabilize the battery. The first one was already shown. Bore, uh, take a hole and drive a current in the, in the, in the other direction. This stabilizes the battery completely. The other one is also motivated by plasma physics. It's a so-called Kraskal Shafranov instability. If you have a certain B set together with your B phi, you can stabilize your pinch in a very similar manner. So we came up with the idea, and it was in this paper, a Journal of Power Sources by Norbert. So let's take the current here and then wind around such a loop here to make a B set like, like so. And you can also stabilize the battery. This would be a tricky thing for a metal petrol instability, for, but for the Taylor instability, we could kill it quite, quite nicely. So we even had some little patents on, on this, but it's not so important. Now comes an important part. This brings us a little bit more to the dynamo. And I would like at least to spend some 10 minutes today on, on dynamo because it's embedded into a dynamo meeting here. This are the technical stabilization means. So we might have some axial magnetic field B set, or we might have some change of the radial structure of B phi. Both is working as a stabilization. In principle, the battery or uh, the liquid metal could produce similar effects by itself in order to accomplish saturation of the instability. And here we are coming to the alpha and beta effect of mean field electrodynamics. Uh, this means an alpha effect could produce a current which is in the liquid, which is going parallel to the B phi. So this is alpha effect. So it would lead to some kruskal shafranov limit in, in the best case. A radially dependent beta effect is in a way, corresp uh, corresponds in a way to a sort of change of B phi of R. So both mean field effects could lead to the effect that we have a stabilization of the battery in the sense of uh, saturation of The bad thing is, at low magnetic Prandtl numbers, we have learned that neither the alpha effect nor the beta effect is strong enough to accomplish anything. They are just much too small to do anything. And we have learned in Norwalk simulation that in our case, for small PM, uh, the saturation is produced by the generation we have, of course, the Taylor instability, which is m equal 1 here. But then we get a nonlinear interaction, and we get m0 modes. We get m2 mode. And here in this energy plot, you see m1 is 
be exponentially increasing. This is logarithm of the Reynolds number. And then here you get the energy of the M0 and M2. And when they are reaching the level of the M1, then you get indeed saturation and you get a flat energy. Uh, and so we, we have learned that in our case, all the saturation depends on a hydrodynamic, on the change of a hydrodynamic base state and not on alpha and beta. Still, alpha and beta are interesting beasts because we are also dealing with dynamos. And so we were looking for both of them. So we did a standard <coughs> Taylor uh, instability numerical experiment here. You see the velocity is increasing. Again, it's the logarithm here. It's increasing uh, exponentially. And then what, you s what we see here, there is a time when we are running into saturation where the alpha effect, the turbulent helicity, acquires some value before it goes to zero. The beta effect gets also some value. They are uh, ridiculously small, but we have some value, and this saturates at a certain uh, value here. And now this was at a Hartmann number 55. I remind you that the critical Hartmann number was 21, so we are three times uh, over, over critical. But what happens now if we still increase the Hartmann number? And the effect was quite amazing. With Hartmann number 70, we see that our alpha is developing some vigor, some oscillation. Still damped, but we have an oscillation of alpha. And if we still increase Hartmann to 100, we get, and you see it here, an oscillation of our alpha. A uh, video doesn't run uh, at the moment. You, you can imagine the Taylor instabilities. These are two rolls like this, and they are making such a motion. So this is correspond corresponds to some helicity with a changing with a changing sign. So and this makes really some oscillation uh, of the alpha effect. And this brings me now to a big jump from the battery to the solar dynamo. Uh, and I would like to speak a little bit about this alpha effect and the chance to have an oscillatory alpha effect in the taco climb, where we have also quite small magnetic Prandtl number, not liquid metal, 10 up to minus 5, but 10 up to minus 2 or 3. And let's see what we can do with such an oscillatory alpha effect. So for the battery guys among you, I have to remind you a little bit what is a solar dynamo. Solar dynamo is a big machine which transfers the kinetic energy of the motion of the solar plasma into magnetic field energy. And for this, we need two different effects. We need a so-called omega effect, which produces by the differential rotation uh, a strong toroidal magnetic field which is nice, but still we have always to um, regenerate the polar idle magnetic field. And this has been proposed by Eugene Parker in 55 and then uh, described mathematically by Steinbeck krause Redler in the 60s. Uh, this alpha effect might sit in the so-called convection zone, but maybe also in the Tacoclein region of the sun. And this alpha effect can produce from the Toro idle field, some polo idle field, as shown here by, by this cartoon. So solar dynamo theory is quite, quite old. People are working on this since 50, 60 years by, by now. Uh, they have very, very nice models. In principle, you can now, with a reasonable alpha omega model with some meridional circulation, more or less uh, reconstruct the the shape of the butterfly diagram, which you might know, uh, which is approximately like this. This is simulation by Karak. So everything is, is nice. And if you play a little bit with the numbers of the meridional circulation and the resistivity, you can even get the period of the hail cycle, which is approximately uh, 22 years. So most people believe that's it. We can still refine. We can make better three-dimensional simulation. But there is nothing special. We believe there is something missing here. And what is missing here is that we do not understand that the solar dynamo 
is more regular than you would expect from such a type of dynamo. This means when you look into the sequence of minima and maxima, they really look like as if they were clocked by an external clock. And this, ex when you look into the numbers, you see that the Schwabe cycle has a periodicity of approximately 11.07 years. And many, many people have noticed that this 11.07 years is the same period as a, uh, as a springtide period of the tidally dominant planets Venus, Earth, Jupiter. All this sounds terribly astrological. And maybe it is, but the, the parallelity between the solar cycle and the spring tides of the three planets is really uh, fascinating. So you can, you can take here the cycle number uh, over the maximum Venus, Earth, Jupiter alignment and you see approximately one line. If you take only the residuals from this, you see a little wiggling by some years but not very much, it's never running away. So it looks much more as a clock process uh, than as a random walk process. So there is even, not only from the last uh, millennium, but also from an early millennium in the, in the early Holocene, there is also some indication from algae data, I cannot discuss this, that indeed the solar dynamo seems to be clocked by whatever process. So there is a phase stability over a thousand years, which is amazing. And I believe this still has to be explained. So this brings now our battery and our alpha effect into play. We have seen that at a certain critical threshold of the Hartmann number or the magnetic field strength, the alpha effect tends to undergo some oscillation, which we have seen here, this oscillation. And now we can ask, Okay, if I have such a sensitive beast here, such an alpha effect which is prone to some oscillation, what happens if I have some weak tidal forcing? Taylor is m equal one, like this. Tidal forcing is m equal two. And now you can a little bit imagine, we have a m equal two forcing on such a role here. What will happen? You have a certain chance that this sloshing instability, this Taylor-like, will be synchronized by this M2 forcing. This is the main idea. And this was shown by, again by Norbert Weber, we have seen here, this is the amplitude of the alpha oscillation over the ratio of uh, external perturbation um, over the intrinsic frequency of the alpha oscillations, and you see here an extremely strong resonance here. So at this point where the intrinsic oscillation frequency of alpha fits to the external perturbation, you get a very strong increase of the amplitude of the alpha oscillation without changing the energy content. This is quite amazing. So your role, your Taylor role, is still the same. The the uh, Reynolds number is not changed, but what is changed is the frequency of the sloshing movement here. And I found this quite interesting. This gives you a, a chance to, uh, for, for some weak tidal forces to influence um, the alpha effect. Okay, we played then with some simple alpha omega models uh, with such a tidally, tidally synchronized alpha effect and we got here in this one-dimensional model some reasonable uh, butterfly, not perfect, uh, in, maybe I, I skip this here, in, in a later, in a very recent paper, we used a two-dimensional model, which is more or less realistic. Here we have the, uh, the omega effect, meridional circulation, the alpha effect in the convection zone, alpha effect in the tachocline here, and what we get then is a wonderful parametric resonance, so with a little bit of forcing, you can indeed entrain, enslave your dynamo period to the external frequency of 22 years. And here in this paper, we show that what we need is something like some decimeter per second 
uh, of alpha in the tacocline region in order to entrain the entire dynamos. This is not much. And at my very last slide, I will show you that this is even not unrealistic. Okay, I stop here with Taylor, alpha, beta, whatever. I come now to uh, really, uh, really Vena convection. And there has been a lot of work on liquid metal battery. I will show us a few slides before. But before that, I still have to come back to alpha. <laughs> uh, we did an experiment here with Rayleigh Bena, replacing the quite complicated Taylor instability experiment, where it would have been wonderful to see the synchronization of alpha, but the experiment itself is quite hard to accomplish. So we made a so-called um, um, a sort of surrogate. We made a classical Rayleigh Bena experiment. Heat it up here, cool it up here, gallium indium tin. What you get then is your large scale circulation. And then it has been known for, for many decades this large scale circulation undergoes a complex uh, mixed sloshing and torsional motion like, like this. So it's classical papers by Brown and Alos. You see here's a torsional motion, here's a sloshing motion. And we did such an experiment. Uh, quite classical, and we used uh, quite a couple of uh, magnetic uh, 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 ultrasonic sensors. And then we put this classical Rayleigh Bena experiment into our Multimac facility at HJTR, and which has six coils here. And then we used only two coils of them in order to produce a M equal to tight like perturbation. So we have a Rayleigh Bena with its intrinsic sloshing and torsional. And then we act on this with the M equal to tight like perturbation, which we periodically perturb. And then we look what happens. And indeed, as this was done by Peter Justel in the numerics by um, Sebastian Röhrborn. Indeed, when we increase the, the current in those coils here, uh, between 12 amps and 27 amps, we get more or less a perfect synchronization of the helicity oscillation of this sloshing uh, LSC. So here, this can be measured in terms of a maximal correlation coefficient between the external perturbation and the bottom three sensor. This goes up to 0 0.8. This is more or less perfect. Uh, synchronization of the helicity, and we have we have learned we have learned in the numerics that here this is a typical picture from pure Rayleigh Bena and pure Rayleigh Bena. You have your sloshing motion going from left to right, and here in this uh, synchronized one, it it goes a little bit more like this symmetrically, but we have the synchronization of the helicity. Coming back now to the LMBs, there has been plenty of work by Doug Kelly. Well, I think you were the, the first doing Rayleigh Bena, maybe for liquid metal batteries, I guess. Uh, Oleg Tsikhanov has done a lot of work. Of course, it's working more or less, especially here in the electrolyte and then in the, sorry, I know it, in the negative, in the negative. <laughs> I should have, I, I use, but you know what I mean. So I, I mean the negative, sorry for that. Uh, and here is, of course, a lot of, here is the strongest effect of, of, of Rayleigh Bena. Uh, we have not only thermal convection, we have also solutal convection, especially here when the lithium is going into the bismuth or whatever you have, and if it is going back here, and we have an asymmetry between the charging and the discharging process, which has to do with the fact that when the lithium is, lithium is going up, then the heavy uh, bismuth is staying here and it falls down, makes such a fingering instability. And so, and this is fantastic work and I would like to recommend Tom Weyer's lecture and also Caroline Zucek's poster on, on that. And here is a recent simulation by, by Paolo Personifex. I come now to electrovortex flow. I think most of you know what electrovortex flow is. Uh, translated to a liquid metal battery. So in a liquid metal battery, even if it is wide and large and great, at some point, we must attach a wire to it. 
and this wire is thinner than the big electrode. And what we will get then is, here's a current coming. At some point, we will have some radial component of the current, which was not in our Taylor instability experiment, but here it is. We get a radial current, and this radial current, together with the B phi, which is the strongest field here, produces, and they, uh, Peter has worked a lot on this, uh, produces a force which is acting inward. And it produces a strong jet. There is a classical paper by Shercliffe with a point source here. And again, Norbert Weber has done a lot of uh, simulations. If you take such an electrode here, electrode here, and then you play with the ratio of height over radius, you will get different uh, structures of the flow, which is emerging here. You can play a lot. And of course, then you have to look what is really the battery structure, what is the specific battery, and to do a simulation. This is all possible now with, with this code of Norbert. In addition to this, we have done an electrobotic flow experiment at HZR. This was mainly done by Ke Leo. So we have taken a little uh, volume of gallium indium tin, not very large, 60 millimeters height, 50 uh, in, in diameter here, and we have an electrode here. And then we were looking with ultrasonic what happens with this jet. So the usual thing is that you get a, a strong jet going down. It's coming from the, from the radial inward forcing. It's going down. Uh, and then what happens now if we have, in addition to this, some axial magnetic fields? This is a classical case. And we have seen here, this is numerics, but agrees qu uh, quite well uh, with, the, uh, with the experiment. So without any magnetic field, you get a very nice straight and, and uh, jet going down here. It becomes uh, not so deep when you have a certain magnetic field. And for an even higher magnetic field, it becomes quite uh, flat here. And it starts to deflect and to rotate. So what we get here, again, we get a rotating jet, which is going around, which is also producing, by the way, helicity. This was uh, a quite small experiment like this with 80 amps. This is not a, it's not a lot. But in, in a joint project with our colleagues in, in Perm in Russia, uh, we have, uh, we have made, uh, constructed uh, an experiment which is made in, which is made in Perm which much higher uh, currents, 1,000 amps. And I think it's the first experiment where such high currents were um, used for uh, electrobotics flow. So you see here again a current going up here, then you have the liquid, and then the axial velocity has been measured in this direction. And the result was fascinating. What you get is, at the beginning you get your jet coming from, the, uh, uh, from this uh, radial forcing, it goes up here. But then, even with a very weak magnetic field, it might be the Earth's magnetic field or a little bit more, what you get then is a slow increase of your toroidal motion. It takes quite long. What is it here? 100 seconds. Quite long. You have your strong polar idle flow, but then more and more you get toroidal motion. And then what we get is exactly what Peter has described in his paper. Uh, that the polar idle flow is dramatically suppressed by this toro idle motion. You see here, this is um, experimental work. Here is numerical work. You see after some time, the polar idle flow has completely disappeared or nearly disappeared. And we have only the rotational uh, flow here. Uh, we can put it into such a plot here when you take the external magnetic field here and the energy in the polar idle flow, the red one, and in the azimuthal one here, there comes a point where both are approximately the same, and then the azimuthal uh, energy is becoming dominant while the uh, polar idle uh, flow becomes complete, more or less completely suppressed. The agreement with experiment is not perfect, but at least reasonable, and I can there are new results by Peter Frick also in JFM this year, I think this month, 
on the interpretation. It's quite a tricky thing with the Ekman pumping and, and uh, you know, we can discuss maybe in, in more and more detail this explore. I come now to the waves. Uh, Tidally forced, but before I will, I will say a little bit more on um, usual metal pad roll instability. Uh, here is a typical example. Uh, this is from also from Weber 2019. So imagine that we have our electrolyte here, and then we have uh, a current going through, and we will we also have a, an excellent magnetic field and what you get then is a uh, is a force which is going in toro idle direction and this makes this famous usual metal pad roll instability here this is an example from magnesium and antimon uh, and we have now looked what is really the criterion for destroying this layer by making it simply too strong and here again we get this criterion of, of Saylor. Uh, this is the product of the current times the axial magnetic field, D0Z, over this, over this potential energy. And you see at a certain point of the Saylor parameter between two and three, we get uh, a complete destruction of the electrolyte layer thickness and then our battery would be destroyed. So we have a measure here for defining the critical currents uh, and or defining the heights of our layer. So this can be now quite well described. So this was uh, for a two layer system. Gerrit Horstmann has worked a lot together also with Vice Herrmann and colleagues in, in Paris on, on the three layer system. This becomes quite messy. You have to solve now a, a fourth order dispersion relation with these elongations or with these heights here, this becomes quite tricky. Uh, Gerrit has found two different uh, frequencies, a high frequency for the symmetric uh, uh, role and a low frequency for this anti-symmetric. You can play a lot with this. And I, I can only recommend this paper by, by Gerrit, which is really fantastic here in this sense. Waves. I would like to give you an answer to my questions uh, half an hour ago. Is it enough for the tidal forcing to synchronize the dynamo? And again, it was the experience of Gerrit with those waves in liquid metal batteries, which helped us a lot to understand also other waves in the sun. So now it's not the Taylor instability, but uh, magneto Rossby waves. magneto Rossby waves are presently under very, very intense observational and numerical investigations. There are wonderful papers by Dick Patti and Sakharashvili and, and others. And here is one great example from this paper. Here you see the magnetic Rossby waves at the Tacho Klein and you see how they interact uh, with the differential rotation uh, of the Tacho Klein and with the magnetic field. There's fantastic physics here behind. And what uh, Gerrit has done now is to look on the possibility that those magneto Rossby waves might be excited by tidal forcing. And he took really realistic tidal potentials from Jupiter, for example, and was looking for different types of Kelvin magneto Rossby waves and so on at different heights. What could be the amplitude of the excited wave? And for some of the waves, Gerrit found indeed, oh, it's, it's not nicely seen here, he found uh, amplitudes of 100 centimeters per second, one meter per second. This is, when I remember, I, I remember you, this is exactly the size of the alpha or the size of the velocity which would be needed to entrain the entire solar dynamo. So maybe it's not complete rubbish what we are doing here. We are bringing different things together. And with that, I would like so thank you. I think we have tried to do something on liquid metal batteries. And we took some, what we learned here, put it back to the sun. And with that, I, I thank you. And this is our group. Uh, I didn't show you anything about our precession-driven dynamo. So here you see the, the vessel. But this is a battery group. That's why uh, batteries, dynamos, and all that. Many thanks. <coughs> Thank you.
Okay, so we have time for a few questions. We have five, five minutes. Yes? Uh, the alpha effect that uh, we turned from negative values to zero uh, was oscillating around zero at the end. And uh, so you have an oscillating alpha with an average of zero. Is that actually what you are envisaging for astrophysical purposes? Oh, of course not. In, in this model here, this is not a taco climb. This is a body like this, non-rotating, only the current. And then you get uh, alpha is oscillating around zero. If you make it rotating, you will get uh, a certain value, a ground level here, a certain ground level here. Uh, this will change. But of course, this comes from the rotation, which was not in this model. But we, of course, we, we know for a rotating body and with also some axial magnetic fields, the sign of alpha is changing from north to south. More questions? So now it's time for your questions, just to. <laughs> I don't know if the trick works every time. Yes. So uh, thank you, very interesting talk. The paper, paper from this uh, Kolesinchenko group, group was very interesting, the Russian group. Uh, the suppression of the polaroid flow is, has been a controversial, sort of controversial topic for liquid metal batteries. Is that correct? Because uh, some people have not observed that in their simulations. Uh, at least it's a, in the first instance, it's a fundamental experiment. But if we would think about what happens in a, in a liquid metal battery, so let's assume you start, you make charging or discharging. You start with a strong polar idle flow, but then you have still some B set somewhere. So you would, you would drive very, very slowly rotational uh, flow. At, at some point, there, there comes a point where you get complete uh, uh, suppression. And now it depends what you want. In the cathode, in the positive, uh, there are sometimes you want to have uh, you want to have um, electro vortex flow in order to mix, and this would be a fantastic mixing. But then it could happen the mixing stops because you don't have any polar idle flow. I think the, the consequences for liquid metal batteries are still to be uh, elaborated. But we have m we have with the, with the firm colleagues we have made a, a very first experiment showing this what you. Uh, had predicted 20 years ago, 23 years ago now, right? <laughs> Could it be that they didn't, didn't, it didn't wait long enough in simulations and that therefore they didn't, didn't see the swirl flow? I think in, in, both, in, in the, uh, both in the experiment and in the numerics, we have waited so long that we get this polar idle flow suppression. There were some early experiments which were done only for a few seconds where they still had only the polar idle flow but not the suppression right. because they did not wait long enough for the polar idle yeah, uh, uh, flow to, to build so up. I think I'm referring to the paper by uh, Kelly and Ashur where I think they report that they, they didn't see the, the suppression of polar idle flow. So could, could it be that they, they may not have waited for long enough to see the soil flow? I, I, think, I, yeah, Kelly Doug, I think I have to look into the, we have to discuss in, in detail sure. whether uh, maybe the Yeah, okay. Or maybe the, the current was not strong enough. I, I do not remember the, the numbers exactly, but we have to discuss. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Can I ask about the very last thing you presented about the magneto-Rossby waves? Yes. What's, what's the natural frequency of those waves? That Sorry? Point? What is the natural frequency of the waves? that you're uh, synchronizing by tidal forces? Uh, it, is, it is over omega zero. Omega zero is the rotation of the, of the sun. And then you have here 10 up, well, it's not, not nicely to be, 10 up to minus uh, one is this magnetorosby waves, inertia gravity waves in the order of, of one or so. It depends on the, on the character of the wave. But I is it significantly different from the 11 year cycle? Sorry? Is it significantly different from the 11 year? Uh, definitely, cycle. but the point is, how could 11 years play out? And maybe because it is a, because it is a, a spring tide, if you manage to get some energy, even in the range of 100 days, say, right, into the system, and then you have a, a modulation of your intensity of this, 
then you could modulate all this effect by the 11 years. So the basic frequency might, uh, the basic period might be much smaller, but because of the, was Einhorn, uh, because of the envelope character, you might still get some effect here. Maybe it's a little bit different to the quite very, very first ideas, but here we are relying a little bit more on the envelope character. But we can discuss it if you feel it. Last question? Maybe I have one. The synchronization effect, is this something that is always, that, that you could use to manipulate the stability of a liquid metal battery? Huh. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we have seen that the Taylor instability seems to be not the big player, clear, right? Then we have to look all for all these MPRs and, and uh, three layer. Uh, then one might, one might think it's also, yeah, it's sort of M1, yeah, right? Maybe one could do something with stabilization. Actually, I, I never thought about this, <laughs> but we, we, sh we could do it, yes, yes. Okay, so we have a coffee break. Uh, in okay. the meantime, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, Frank. <laughs>